Hey everyone, welcome back to another video on the Chapton Towers building collapse. Someone was kind enough to send me a link to all the drawings for the building and what I've done is I've picked out the relevant structural engineers drawings and I'm going to be doing a review on them. Hopefully this review will kind of debunk some of the assumptions that some people have made but mainly is to get an insight on how the building was designed or if it was actually external sources or unforeseen circumstances that actually caused the building to actually collapse. So looking at the basement level drawing first, the first thing which actually strikes me the most is actually the lack of shear or core walls this building has. So for people that don't know what shear walls are, basically shear walls are there to resist the wind forces acting on the building. So in one direction, which I've marked in red, we can see that we've got two long lengths of wall to resist that wind load. However, in the other direction, highlighted in blue, we've only got these two little walls resisting that wind load. For a 13 storey building, I think the structure has the bare minimum amount of stability walls. And this is probably my first point of major concern. Another thing which I thought was quite strange was how the stair core on the right only had that one shear wall. I would have thought that they would have made the whole thing out of concrete to make sure that it was a really stiff stability element. In my opinion, it really makes no sense not to have made that whole core out of concrete and they probably did it just to save some money. Okay, so what we have here is a pile cap drawing. So what's great about this is it tells us this building is definitely piled. And what the notation is next to the pile cap, like 3PC or 10PC, means the number of piles in that pile cap. This is clearer when I show you the pile cap details. So we've definitely got a perimeter concrete wall, 8 inches, which I think is around 200 millimeters. Straight off the bat, 200 mil thick seems quite minimal to me especially given the environment that the building is located at with the high salts and everything in the waters. So for the footing of the retaining wall, we can see these staggered piles and this is quite common. So moving up from the foundation level or the pile cap level, we've got the basement slab and this framing plan is basically showing us the reinforcement that they're planning to put into the slab. I didn't realize at the start until I found a note on a different drawing, but basically all these bars here are additional bars in the top reinforcement and there's basically a bottom mat of reinforcement that is added throughout the slab. So moving up a level again to the lobby area, this is where we've got the swimming pool in the bottom right hand corner. This is shown on the architect's drawing. So if we move to the engineer's drawing on the same level, we can basically see that there's a void, but dash line is the wall below that. So moving down to the foundation plan, we can see that the swimming pool is supported off these piled ground beams. I'm just going to do a quick sketch session of this area just to kind of show what the structure is actually doing. So moving to the lobby floor plan where the swimming pool level was, we're again looking at the reinforcement drawing of the slab. Now there doesn't seem to be that much to be noteworthy, I mean there's a few steps in the slab but that's about it. But what is provided on this drawing is some typical details. So this is a typical detail where you've got a step in a slab or a change in level. And basically what this detail is kind of showing is the reinforcement which is going into the slab and the kind of step or the beam. Now what's striking about this detail is that in the lower level slab there's no top reinforcement showing. Also what's a little bit concerning for me is the lack of anchorage for the reinforcement. So if you have a look at the bars which I've clouded, the red bar and the light blue bar, you can kind of see that they don't anchor into the concrete very far at all. So if you imagine that you're installing some fence posts in your garden basically want to dig a big enough hole for that fence post in to make sure that it doesn't just pull out the ground. Well this is the same kind of concept for when you're detailing reinforcement in concrete. So one other thing which I noticed about this slab reinforcement is that they haven't provided any shear links to resist against punching shear failure. Now just because they haven't provided punching shear links doesn't mean that the design is wrong, it's just something to note. So moving up to the second floor plan, we can see that they've provided some typical notes. Now these notes are really really important and it provides us with some critical information about the building. So the slab thickness for the lobby level is 9.5 inches which is about 240 mil and the slab at the basement is 9 inches which is about 225 or 230 mil. Then for all the other floors including the roof it's 8 inches which is around 200 mil. In my opinion the slab thicknesses are definitely on the thin side. For the typical floors, which are 8 inches or 200 mil thick, I think they're probably okay given that the common spacings are about 6 meters to about 7 meters long. So 200 mil thick is just about workable, but I still think it's quite thin. 
I think what's most concerning is the thickness for the basement and the lobby level slab because they're more likely to be exposed to the elements. There are some concrete slab details which I'll be showing you later and what it shows you is the cover to the reinforcement and it's also why I think that the slab thickness is a bit of a problem for the basement and the lobby level slabs. The second note is about the strength of the concrete but what I'm not sure is, is it all the concrete structure or is it just for slabs? So the third and fourth note is about the reinforcement and like I mentioned earlier basically whenever there's a reinforcement plan all the reinforcement shown is the top reinforcement and what they're saying in the fourth note is that they're providing a mat of bottom reinforcement and any additional bottom reinforcement is marked on the drawings. This is quite standard and to be honest isn't much of a concern to me. This fifth note is about how the reinforcement is placed around the column strip and this kind of shows to me that they kind of know what they're doing when they're designing flat slab because that's what you're meant to do. I've had a look at the typical floor plan which covers from the second floor all the way to the penthouse. I've looked at the penthouse floor plan and also the roof plan and to be honest there's nothing that noteworthy so I'm just going to skip ahead to the details. So now moving on to the pile cap or the foundation details and what these details show us is the size of the pile caps and the number of piles per pile cap. It also gives us the reinforcement and also the depth of the pile caps. So what's interesting about this pile cap section is that it's showing tension piles and this section is going to be near the shear walls and these are the massive pile caps for the two shear cores or shear walls. So now we've got a beam schedule drawing and this shows us the reinforcement in all the beams across the whole building. What's interesting about this bar is the anchorage from the beam into the column. Because of the bar type which is used, I think that the beam is probably designed as a simple connection and not a moment connection. Next we've got a column schedule and on the side it basically tells us the concrete grade or the concrete strength of the columns. And basically what this tells us is they're using a higher strength of concrete for the columns which are closest to the basement level because they're taking a higher amount of force or supporting a greater amount of load. So I'm trying to find out the sizes of these columns but because I'm not familiar with feet and inches I'm converting them into millimetres. And just looking at the sizes they don't seem particularly undersized or too small. For a 12 or 13 storey building with a grid spacing of about 6 to 7 metres these column sizes feel about right. So next moving on to the section details and first let's have a look at the shear wall detail and this is the first time that we see that the shear wall is actually 300mm thick or 12 inches. What's also quite interesting to note is the size and the spacing of the reinforcement. So it says here a number 4 bar which is about 10mm at 12 inches which is about 300mm spacing. For a shear wall I think that's quite a lightly reinforced wall. So this is the retaining wall or the basement perimeter wall which was shown on the basement floor plan and the wall is only 8 inches thick which is about 200mm and we can also see that the reinforcement that they've provided is only a single layer. Now I think that the retaining wall is quite thin at 200mm thick and also only providing a single layer of reinforcement is kind of worrying. I think the layout of the piles for the retaining wall is a bit odd. I would expect that the piles would be spaced out a bit further and closer to the stem of the retaining wall. So now moving on to the slab details and the first thing we should do is to have a look at the general notes on the side of the drawing and what the notes show us is that they're actually using 14 by 14 inch precast concrete driven piles and these work out to be about 350 millimeters squared. Now I said that they're a bit small but the amount of piles which they're using is quite a lot so it's probably okay. I don't think any of the other notes are anything to be noteworthy of. So this is where we've got a cantilever slab or where the balconies are and I know technically a cantilever slab you don't technically need any reinforcement in the bottom but because of the environment you probably do want bottom bars in to prevent the slab from cracking and because they're not showing it in the details and they hadn't shown it in the reinforcement slab plans I'm pretty confident that they're not providing punching shear reinforcement in the slab and just to reiterate just because they haven't provided it doesn't mean that the design is wrong. What's really important to know about the top reinforcement within this slab is that they've only placed a sort of square patch of top reinforcement over the column head. So in essence they've got no top steel or reinforcement in between the columns at mid-span. Whilst it might be okay for designing for the forces, 
it's not very good in terms of robustness detailing. So from my review of the drawings, there are four key things which kind of stand out to me. First of all, I think the amount of stability elements is quite minimal within this building. Secondly, I think the reinforcement detail is quite minimal and if it was up to sort of modern day standards, I don't think it would be up to scratch. Thirdly, the lack of concrete cover to the reinforcement. And now lastly, the lack of punching shear reinforcement. Having done this review, I actually think that there's a punching shear failure in the lobby slab or the slab just above the basement. The reason I think this is because punching shear failure happens quite quickly and is rarely like slowly and progressively. The lack of continuity in the reinforcement within the slab also does not help resist punching shear failure, as well as the fact that there is no punching shear reinforcement. To give you an understanding of what punching shear failure is, take a pen or a pencil, nib side up and a sheet of paper. The pen or pencil is your column and the paper is your slab. Without applying too much force, the pen can punch through the paper. To be able to resist punching shear failure, you can either thicken up your slab or provide a bigger column. So if you flip the pen the other way around and try to do the same to the piece of paper, you'll find that you'll need a much greater force to punch through the piece of paper or the slab. This is essentially punching shear in a nutshell. A side note, you can also increase the resistance of punching shear failure by providing punching shear reinforcement via links. And in this case, these slabs do not have this kind of reinforcement. I think the first point of failure happened in the middle, just between the two shear walls or the two shear cores. From the building collapse video, you can kind of see that the middle portion of the building collapses first, and the right hand side stays up for about a second before it finally collapses as well. Like I mentioned earlier in the video, I think there's actually quite a lack of lateral stability in one direction. And I think if the stair core on the right hand side had been all made out of concrete, I think that right hand side might have stood a chance of staying up. But because it only had that one shear wall in the one direction, it's not surprising that that part of the building fell down about a second later after the middle bit collapsed. I also think it managed to fail like this is because there was a lack of robustness within the design. And if you design an element or a building for robustness, it basically means that the failure of, say, example, a slab or a column won't cause progressive collapse of any other structural element. If there was an adequate amount of detailing or anchorage within the reinforcement of the slabs and the columns, in the event that a slab or a column actually failed, the slabs would actually behave in a sort of continuary action or frame action of the entire building, which means that the slab would have failed, but it wouldn't have caused the other slabs above to fail as well. I think the slab failed via punching shear, and basically what this caused was excessive forces which the building was not capable of resisting because it was never designed for it. It basically caused a huge chain reaction of failures, and once that chain reaction happened, the building collapses. I believe that the root cause was actually because there was signs of a significant rusting and concrete spalling within the basement. And I think given the length of time that the reinforcement was exposed to the elements, basically significantly weakened the structure. I think that it also didn't help that the concrete cover to the reinforcement was actually very, very low. And concrete cover is there to protect the reinforcement from the elements. I think had there been regular inspections and remedial works done, I think this tragedy and disaster could have been averted. Hopefully you found this video interesting and informative. This is just my theory and I'm going to be putting some numbers to my theory to see if I can prove or disprove my theory. I think it's really important that you back up your theory with calculations or real hard evidence. Anyways, if you want to see that video, please remember to like and subscribe and I'll catch you on that next video. Cheers.